Even more striking evidence is provided by this Chinese painting of an African giraffe dating from the year 1414. The giraffe was sent as a gift to the Chinese emperor from one of the cities of the Swahili. Looking rather indignant, it must have endured a voyage of many months. The Swahili cities were built at short distances from each other all down the long East African coastline. The southernmost of them was the chief point which linked the Indian Ocean traders with the gold-producing region of the southern African interior. On this high and fertile plateau, a flourishing civilization had developed, which, like the kingdoms of West Africa, played a decisive role in the trading patterns of the Middle Ages. And here on these temperate grasslands, a unique culture, emerging in about the 12th century, reached its climax in the splendid buildings which are known today as Great Zimbabwe. Efforts to recapture the essence of Great Zimbabwe culture were undermined a century ago by treasure-seeking Europeans. They came up from South Africa and ransacked this place for gold and jewellery soon after they discovered it. A few pieces escaped the looters, all made from local gold, mined extensively in the area from about the year 800. But perhaps even more surprising are some of the objects found here for which Zimbabwe gold was traded. Delicate ornaments brought across the ocean from China and India. It's evidence like this which has helped historians and archaeologists to piece together the whole great story of long-distance trade. That trade had its source in the Zimbabwe cultures of inner Africa, which possessed the skills as well as the wealth to build powerful monuments. On these massive walls, overlooking the entire area, stood sacred bird carvings in stone. They were associated with oracles that were thought to speak for the gods. The religious heart of Great Zimbabwe stood on a hilltop commanding the surrounding countryside. In the valley below, the king had his royal residence. All this activity called for a strong central government, and that government was formed by their king and council, who ruled from here through lesser kings and governors in a wide territory across the vast central plateau of southern Africa. Even now, these mighty walls make an irresistible claim to political power and achievement. Seventeen feet thick in places and eight hundred feet in length, they're as big and impressive as a great cathedral. Far too impressive as it turned out for the white settlers of later years. They refused to believe that this could have been the work of Africans, or that these very Africans had a trading network which stretched right across the known world. 